Bravo Class Project 690, Keffel, or the Mullet. All right, our story begins in 1960 at the Malachite Submarine Design Bureau. This is the same design bureau that's been building many of the submarine and ships designs since the so Soviet Union era and continues to operate today. Preliminary design studies begin for a target submarine. So this submarine is going to fulfill at least three roles. One, it's going to be a torpedo test target. That's its primary role. But it's also going to be used as a target for anti-submarine aviation and ASW ships to practice hunting submarines without using a real submarine that could otherwise be deployed during the Cold War. And then finally, the crews on the Bravo class submarines will be training crews. They'll have brand new, you know, fresh out of submarine school conscripts and, uh, you know, petty officers, or they call them warrant officers in the Russian Navy. Uh, and then they'll have instructors also on board with them that are senior experienced submariners to make sure that they don't sink their submarine and kill themselves. And so that's going to be the crew makeup. And that's the three objectives that this submarine class achieves. It is a torpedo testing target, it is an ASW training target, and it is a submarine crew training vessel. They're going to build four of them. So the design requirements are is that it must be self-propelled. It can't just be towed around and left to bob around as a target. Uh, it has to have similar characteristics as a full-scale submarine and a minimum submerged speed of 18 knots. And that is to assist in, you know, providing realistic target simulation and good training for the crews. Uh, most importantly, the hull must be reinforced and able to absorb a torpedo hit at high speed, but with no warhead. And the torpedoes, when they're fully fueled, weigh over two metric tons, which is over 2,000 kilotons, or two kilotons. Um, and that's a lot of energy that's going to be hitting the fencing or the outside, the outer hull of this submarine. So they're going to come up with a clever design that will absorb that energy without sinking the submarine. 1963, a resolution is signed by the Central Committee. Again, this is the Soviet Union era. Everything goes through Central Committee. Uh, it says to build a submarine that can withstand a torpedo strike at greater than 50 knots. So the torpedoes of the day, most of them only do between 40 and 50 knots. So they're like, they're making the bar very high, saying, okay, even if the torpedo is going faster than, you know, up to 50 knots, it can withstand the strike. It's going to use a strengthened steel hull. Uh, rescue devices will be at each hatch. They'll have a signal buoy in case it does sink that they can call for help and a reinforced casing around the hatches. You'll see uh, what looks like a coffer dam or fencing uh, around the hatches in some of the photos. I'll point them out to you. So from 1963 to 1965, after the Central Committee makes its declaration, uh, designer A.N. Krylova uh, leads the engineering team. Uh, he goes with a two-hauled approach with an inner hull, the pressure hull being strengthened with rolled steel, and the outer hull is a softer steel so it can be more elastic and bend and dent and absorb kinetic energy when the torpedo strikes it. Uh, must maintain these characteristics down to 250 meters. The test depth will eventually be uh, 300 meters for the ship. Uh, 18 knots was the most difficult milestone to achieve because uh, it's a small, conventionally powered, that means, you know, diesel and battery uh, submarine. And so they had to make some um, weight reduction to to decisions to, main to get up to 18 knots. And the biggest one was they went from a two screw design, two shaft, two screw down to a single screw design. All of the submarines up to this point have been uh, two screw designs. That's mostly for redundancy in case one fails, but they just couldn't make the speed work with the weight. So uh, they went to a single screw, single propulsion plant designed for this training submarine. Uh, they wanted to use fiberglass as the outer hull, uh, but the manufacturing processes of the 1960s couldn't shape the fiberglass uh, in the proper shape at that size and be strong enough to withstand these, uh, these impacts. So they did end up using a different type of steel alloy for the outside of the hull. Again, a little more elasticity than the rigid pressure hull. All right, so we had some testing stages. Stage one was strength test experiments conducted in lab conditions using gravitational methods, meaning that inside an assembly building, they took the steel that they were going to use for the pressure hull and they dropped weights on it from increasing distances, uh, higher and higher, uh, just dropping strong weights and seeing how it impacted and uh, damaged the steel, checking for fractures and cracking and all that stuff. Uh, that's, that's stage one. 
Stage two are the hull joints. So where the hatches are attached to the pressure hull. Typically the weakest part of any submarine is where you have a hatch that leads topside. Um, second weakest is any hull penetration that leads to the water underneath the boat. So they do some uh, testing there with kinetic forces exceeding 50 uh, knots uh, of a torpedo strike. Again, these are all kinetic destructive tests. They're dropping weights on metal in an assembly building to make sure that these things are, are, are water watertight after these, this impact. And then finally, stage three, the pressurized hull is tested to verify watertight integrity. Hull thickness was determined to be uh, 10 millimeters, which is point, almost 0.4 inches, just under half an inch. Relatively thin, especially for the time. Remember, they're trying to reduce weight because this thing has to make 18 knots and maintain it submerged. So in 1967, construction begins at Komsomolsk on a moor shipyard. That is the shipyard that's in the far east of Russia. It is about 100 kilometers upriver from the Pacific Ocean. So whenever they build ships, they need to, you know, take them out of the assembly building that you see there in the picture onto that floating dry dock. And then that floating dry dock is tugged a hundred kilometers up river to the ocean where it is then submerged and released out into the wild. Uh, this shipyard has been around for a very long time since 1932. Um, current numbers have the workers around 15,000. They build both commercial and military vessels and is now operated under United Shipbuilding Corporation, which is the corporation that owns most of the shipyards uh, in Russia. So here's the Bravo by the numbers. Uh, displacement's 2,900 tons submerged. It's length is 69 meters and its width is just under nine meters. Uh, test depth is 300 meters. They do have the D43 diesel engine. This is a very common diesel engine for the time. They put the D43 on most of their conventional boats. Uh, the P141 generator generates 2,700 kilowatts to power the ship and the, uh, and the shaft. It is an electric motor that, that turns the shaft there. It's one shaft, uh, believed to be four bladed, but I could not confirm that. So, uh, it's either four or five, but here in the picture, they even show you a four bladed screw. So that's what I think it is. Uh, 12 knots on the surface, 18 knots submerged and has an endurance of eight, 15 days at sea, uh, or 2,500 miles, whichever comes first. Now the torpedo tubes are interesting. Uh, this is a combat vessel. It has torpedo tubes that work. Uh, it has two 53 centimeter torpedo tubes and there is one crew member who uh, stated that on his Bravo, and I don't know which one it was, one of the torpedo tubes was only 40 centimeters so that they could uh, test fire the smaller diameter torpedoes. Um, he's one source. I could not find a second source to confirm that, but every other source says the Bravos have two 53 centimeter torpedo tubes. But I did want to bring up, it's possible that one of the four had an odd shaped torpedo tube for uh, testing on that specific uh, Bravo. They have the old school World War II era radars, fathometers, sonars, uh, the old, you know, Soviet version of the German periscope. You know, this is basically, keep in mind, this is, you know, about you know, a decade after World War II ends. So they're still using a lot of that older technology just with, you know, a Russian upgrade or Soviet upgrade. Uh, has a crew of 33 people and six officers. Keep in mind, the crew of 33 is a combination of basic seamen students and uh, instructors, or I should say senior submarine qualified people to, to help, help them learn. All right, let's talk about hull one. Hull one is the one on the left in this picture. Uh, S-368, keels laid in 1966, launched in 67. And kinetic pier side testing begins with hull one. And uh, this story is bonkers, but this is how they did it. Uh, so after they built the first one, which is there on the left, they moved it out, they launched it. It's not even commissioned yet. Uh, they move it out to the pier. Um, they do submerge it in the river, uh, and then they drop weights on it with one of the cranes and, uh, the, the weights, you know, are about, uh, 2.6, uh, kilos to 2.600 kilos. So it, it's over two metric tons falling on this, on the top side of this thing, denting the hell out of it, by the way, but it doesn't breach the pressure hull. So it passes the test and then they repair the dents in the hull. 
And uh, once it passed that final test, uh, she is commissioned. <laughs> so uh, she gets commissioned December 31st, 1967, after uh, performing uh, 2,000 nautical miles of sea trials, and uh, 287 of those miles were submerged in the, in the Pacific. She is uh, stationed out of Vladivostok, Russia, uh, participates in naval exercises and at sea weapons testing for her entire operational life uh, there in the Pacific Fleet. Uh, she does participate in the Navy Day Parade in 1990. So after, what, two, three decades of service, she's uh, honored in a parade. Now, this Navy Day Parade includes many other ships of the Soviet Navy, but she's just one of many on that day. And then on June 1992, she is removed from the active ships list. Uh, this is, you know, six months after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And in 1994, she is sold for scrap. So these are training vessels. They don't have the interesting at sea stories that we have with a lot of our other submarines. They literally go out, they train crews, they get shot at and torpedoes hit the hull. I want you to take a look at the picture real quick. Uh, if you look at the hatch forward of the sail there, top side, you can see the fairing that is around the hatch to protect it. That is in case the torpedo uh, just by blind chance happens to hit the hatch it will hit that coffer dam like fairing and damage that instead of the hatch itself remember these hatches are the weakest points in these pressure hulls and so if you if you do anything to the hatch you're going to get water in the boat potentially losing the submarine so they did reinforce all of the hatches Oh, here's a picture of the pier side testing I was telling you about. Um, th those are the cranes that would uh, lift the weights far above the submarine and uh, drop them on top of the of hull one anyway. Uh, hull one was submerged at periscope depth, so just so the deck was or the top of the sail was a wash, so it wasn't a straight hit. It would hit the water, which I'm sure absorbed some of the energy before it hit the the hull, but that was how they did the test. They had um, attached four buoyancy canisters, two port and two starboard, forward and aft, to, uh, you know, in case the ship was lost by the pier, it would not sink by the pier, but um, luckily none of that happened. So it was a three-ton shaped weight. Uh, the 2.6 or 2,600 kilos, that's the weight of the torpedo. So they used a torpedo shape that was a little bit heavier than, than an actual torpedo. And they dropped it from a height of 20 meters. That's that's very high to be dropping a three-ton weight on a submarine. Um, and it did dent the hull, like I said, but did not damage the pressure hull, which means it passed the test. Here's hull two. Hull 2's uh, keel laid in 1967, launched in 68, and commissioned at the end of 1968. So they're getting their flow going now. They got the second one going. Uh, this joins the Pacific Fleet Vladivostok, just like the first one did. In 1969, she has moved to Kamchatka Peninsula, and then around the northern side of Russia, the Arctic side of Russia, to the White Sea, and then down river to the black sea fleet so she transverses uh the circumnavigates if you will the entirety of the northern half of russia from the pacific fleet to the black sea fleet very long journey very impressive that they did that in such a uh, small you know limited capability submarine but you know good seamanship and navigation you know got them got them where they needed to go from 1970 to 75, she's repeatedly hit with torpedoes during testing in the Black Sea. Uh, divers do an inspection of the hull after every exercise to make sure that if there's any damage, they repair it and make sure the pressure hull itself isn't damaged in any way. In 1976, damage to a torpedo strike does require repairs and uh, spends a year repairing the hull. In 1967, she's back in service. In 1982, she does collide with a cargo ship, AKA 312, damaging the stabilizer. And the captain is fired. And the only reason I could find for the captain being fired other than the collision, like the negligence of the collision, is it wasn't navigation as much as it was. He was not authorized to change berths. So he's essentially tied to a pier, like you see here in the picture, and he's gonna go to another pier. But according to deepstorm.ru, that berth change was not authorized. And then during the birth change, wouldn't you know it, they run into a cargo ship that's, I guess, transiting the harbor or something and uh, damaging the submarine. So the captain gets fired for that. I don't have any more details on that. It just seems odd that the captain would decide to move one from one pier to another. There must be more to the story than that. 
but that's that's what we know. Uh, 1997, she's removed from the fleet. So she does serve as a target for another 15 years in the Black Sea, but then she's finally removed from the fleet. 2006, uh, Ukraine sells her for scrap. And in 2008, um, part of the submarine that's remaining, because the, they're tearing the submarine apart for scrap, right? They decide to put part of it on display in Sevastopol, which is in the uh, Crimean Peninsula. So... It's not the entire submarine, but part of it is on display uh, as a memorial to what the Bravo class was. Here is what the uh, transit route looked like for them uh, going to the Black Sea across the northern part of Russia. It must have been quite the journey. You know, we're talking, you know, months of uh, a lot of surface transiting. They probably did most of this on the surface. There's no reason to submerge unless it was really bad weather or if they had to go under ice for any reason, which... Uh, they probably did this in the summertime, so they didn't have to do that. Uh, just a very long, arduous journey, you know, thousands of miles. All right, Hall 3. Hall 3 was laid down in 1967, launched 68, and uh, commissioned in 69. Uh, they're, they're building a lot of these, you know, near the same time, you know, one, one right after the other. Uh, August 1969, she's moved to Ura Bay. Uh, that's in the Kola Peninsula. So... You know, she's doing this transit as well, but stopping at the Kola Peninsula there. In 1970, she becomes part of the Northern Fleet. From 72 to 1991, she trains multiple crews and provides targeting services for the Red Banner Northern Fleet successfully. Not a glamorous career, but a very important one uh, for, for training. Uh, in 1992, she has moved downriver to the Black Sea Fleet. In 1997, she is officially transferred into the Ukrainian Navy, who immediately tries to auction her off, but nobody wants her. And so in 1999, she's cut up for scrap and she is gone. Unlike the other one, uh, she's not saved for any kind of uh, museum or anything. And the last one, Hull 4, keel laid in 69, launched in 70, commissioned at the end of the year or near the end of the year, October 31st. Uh, in 1973, transferred to the Black Sea Fleet as well, has a dry dock period from 75 to 76. Uh, I'm not sure if this was a maintenance period. Uh, there was a modernization period planned, but it was never funded. So the dry docking may have not been for damage. It may have been for modernization, but she did not get any of the modernization upgrades because they weren't paid for. So in 1997, they do kinetic energy tests with the RPK-5 rain anti-submarine bombs. This is basically like the RBU. So they shoot RBUs at it. Of course, the RBUs don't have explosives, but it's still a heavy-ass piece of metal falling on your submarine. Uh, in 1986, she's uh, featured in the film Dolphin's Cry. Now, I was not able to find this film, Dolphin's Cry, but uh, I would encourage everyone to look for it if you're interested in seeing uh, this ship in a movie. Um, and it's probably not playing the Bravo. It may be uh, in the movie playing the part of another submarine, but uh, that would be an interesting piece of history if you could find the movie Dolphin's Cry. In 1997, rather, she's laid up for repairs that are never completed, uh, much like many Soviet-era submarines. Sometimes when they go in for repairs, we never see them again. In 1999, she's put up for auction, but again, not sold. Nobody wants her. And uh, she is authorized to be part of a museum uh, at that time. In 2000, she's towed to Sevastopol uh, to uh, Kyrgyzstan Shipyard. Uh, the submarine was abandoned and looted for scrap because they didn't fund, uh, you know, the restoration for her to become part of uh, a museum, sadly. So, but in 2008, we're back. Museum plans are approved again. Uh, so this is, this is very, you know, kind of political at this point. It is the leadership in, in Ukraine that is authorizing, hey, make this submarine a museum but nobody is funding it. So this is twice they've come back now. In 2010, they do the same thing again. They have a vote in their, you know, parliament or whatever their Congress is to authorize the ship that's in the shipyard to become a museum again in 2010. No action is taken. No money is authorized to pay for it. So they keep making these resolutions without being able to actually do it. It's a little bit embarrassing. 2012, uh, the museum authorization remains in place. Uh, and in 2015, finally, the museum plans are finally canceled after what, seven or even eight years of uh, trying to get it done. And in 2020, the ship is beached in place. And here we have pictures of it. Um, 
big, big credit to uh, sub hunter who is a patron and brought these photos to my attention. And here they are. We'll take another look at a couple of them. She's in a poor state, uh, clearly not, you know, museum worthy. You can see the cranes from the shipyard there in the background. So she's still near the shipyard and, uh, she's just basically, she was towed, you know, to the nearest shoreline and, uh, tied, tied to the shore. And this is where she sits. Uh, very, very sad way for any vessel to end. In my opinion, I often, you know, attach, uh, feelings to these vessels because they perform like, um, like people, you know, cause they have systems, circulatory systems, air systems. They're very human. Like when you're operating them and to see them just be left like this is, uh, disturbing and sad. You know, I really, uh, even though we were on the opposite side of the uh, cold war from the submarine, it deserves better than this. So here are my final thoughts. Um, the story of captain, uh, Grigorov, uh, really rang with me. Um, he was one of the captains of uh, one of the Bravo class submarines. Um, and he talks in detail um, about what it was like to be a target submarine, to know that you're going to go to sea and be shot at uh, with obviously no warhead, but the, the torpedoes are still going to hit you. And uh, he was the captain for a couple of years. So he got to do this repeatedly, even though crews and trainees would cycle in and out after a couple of cruises. Uh, he, he was always there with his XO and his staff. And he talks about what it's like to listen to the torpedo come in. And when it gets close enough, you can hear it. You don't even need a sonar system. And it rings the hull like a gong when it finally hits. A lot of times the torpedoes are not recovered because they just break apart. They hit with such force. And many times his submarine had to be repaired, just dock side, not dry dock. But from the, these blunt impacts, he described them as deafening. So you knew for sure when you got hit and that's, uh, I remember in, you know, my time in the Navy, we played target submarine a lot because, uh, the United States Navy, actually NATO countries in general, we use our own subs to train with each other. So what will happen is, and I'm just going to be kind of vague here, but two submarines will meet and it might be in the Bahamas. Uh, if you guys know my Bahamas stories and, uh, we'll be down there and, uh, one, one submarine will have an inspection team on board, usually if not both. And that submarine has to certify torpedo shots or whatever. So the other submarine is just down there playing target for him. So we're getting experience trying to evade the, 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 the Trafalgar for, or whatever. And we're learning about their tactics and watching them do, do their thing. And they're very quiet, by the way, the Royal Navy doesn't play. They are very quiet submarines. The Royal Navy has. And so it's always a challenge for us even to just detect them, much less do anything like, like try to track them. And they, they shoot at us. And, uh, and that happened multiple times in my career, at least 10, uh, easily 10 times playing, playing the target, because you'll go down to the Bahamas and do that. And every, every time you need to, and from a weapons department perspective, especially some perspective, we look forward to that because that's like real world training. That's not like in a trainer. That's not in a classroom. You're underway on your submarine using your equipment against another submarine. And that's awesome. Uh, it's a lot of fun. But the torpedoes we have today don't actually hit <laughs> submarines. They do something else. I'm not going to talk about it, uh, but they don't actually hit the submarines anymore. Thankfully, I can't imagine what it would be like because I know what it's like to get shot at by, say, the, the spearfish, which is an insane torpedo. And it, you can hear it on sonar, obviously, and it's just coming at you and we're running. We're running at a flank bell. We're running deep. We're running shallow. We're chucking countermeasures from this thing. And it is terrifying. It's like being in a horror movie where the villain just won't stop. The Terminator just won't stop. This machine is just coming after you and nothing you do to the spearfish, especially is going to deter it from getting that ass, you know, <laughs> it's coming. And so, uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, uh, I can't imagine what it's like though, from the captain Gregorov's uh, if I'm saying his name right, a perspective where he knew that torpedo was not going to miss him, that he knew it was going to impact the hull. That is another level of terror above what I experienced. And uh, my hat's off to him for him doing it for so many years. Um, he, I don't know if he, I don't think he does speeches or talks anymore, but if he did, I would, I would definitely want to go to one and hear more of his stories on these training submarines. Anyway, other things, uh, target drones and vessels are a necessary part of naval training, of course. Uh, but being hit while being the target is a very Soviet thing. I think, uh, the evasion at 18 knots is more dramatic when you know, torpedo is going to hit you. Like I said, 
knowing submariners, there's probably some that enjoyed it, right? Uh, submariners, we are a different breed. Uh, not all submariners are the same. We all have our different hangups and stuff. But I know from speaking for myself, when I was in my 20s and a little bit into my 30s, I was an adrenaline junkie. I wanted all that adrenaline. I did other things on my free time, like whitewater rafting. I almost drowned once whitewater rafting. And then I went back and I did it the next day because it was a weekend trip. And uh, so we kind of get off on this stuff, man. We, we, we like it and, and not every submariner likes it, but there, those of us that do really like this stuff. Uh, the modernization was planned, but never realized I talked about that. They were going to take hall four and uh, give it new, new equipment. But being a training submarine, it was at the very end of the budget. And obviously that's the first thing that gets chopped when you're chopping budgets. So it was never uh, authorized. And uh, this is a sad end, like I said, to a, a training platform, but it's kind of expected. No one's going to spend a lot of money uh, on a museum of a training submarine when they could uh, be spending that money on anything else, right? It's, it's not very high on the priority list, but it does pain me to see it in this state. And uh, there's really nothing we can do about it. But I hope maybe this lecture uh, gives it some life. You know, the Bravo class submarines were very interesting. The people on board were very brave. And uh, I'm sure they also, at least some of them, had a lot of fun. All right, I want to say thank you to the Patreons, man. You guys are the best. Love you guys. Uh, big shout out to, to Scott Borg, who is generous beyond uh, anything that I've ever requested.